Ransom. And I'm Harrison. And welcome to Nerd Talk. Uh, we haven't done a show in about two weeks now, I think. We live, y'all. <laughs> uh, there was some technical issues last week. and College schedules, random explosions. Well, no, I was, you know, missing a vehicle to get to the studio. But Inability to drive issue. to a, a radio studio. These are all things. Anyway, so we're back now. It, yep. We return. With tidings of dread. Yes, which we promised we were going to watch, and so we totally watched, and now we can talk about it. Right? So, uh, I, I want to start off with the title character, and... I want to start off with the title, which was a missed opportunity, because this movie is not dreadful. Credit to <laughs> Matt LRR on Twitter. Be- beginning with puns. Anyway, Carl Urban is just like the epitome of Judge Dredd in this movie. Like right from the start, it is clear what we are delivering with this film. Like the opening scenes are a a brief synopsis of Mega City 1 in the history of the world, immediately leading into Dredd killing three people. It is very true to the comic in that it is violent as it is very violent. And then it is also Graphic, kind of funny brutal. while it is so violent. Yeah, it, it has that black sense of humor that Judge Dredd is just notorious for. Like, you know, watching a homeless uh, dude sitting outside of a building being crushed by the, uh, by the defense barrier. That's one of my up. favorite scenes in the movie, considering the source material. Because it is Judge right. Dredd's reaction to that, which is that... Okay, well, this this guy, this innocent, well, person who is guilty only of vagrancy was brutally killed. And Judge Dredd is like, eh, shrug. He doesn't really care very yeah, much. He just kind of looks at it and That's walks pretty standard away. in Mega City 1. Like, well... Yeah, I, I love that every threat in this movie is to the ISO cubes. We can't have prison cells anymore, so we will literally just throw you in a box. It is either to the ISO cubes or having your skin stripped off you and being dropped from, a, like, a mile in the air while on a drug that makes your perception of reality slow. Yeah, Judge Dredd was, like, adequately happy to give that decision. Like, it's it's fine to to give someone the summary execution verdict like usually that's delivered by your pistol but i guess judges are allowed to get creative with their executions Indeed. yeah sometimes casual friday just <laughs> <laughs> you gotta add a little bit of spice into your work week. I, i'm really terrified of the judge's definition of fun day monday this is where the executions get wacky in other words judge dread puts on a clown nose and starts <laughs> shooting people i've got to say there was a scene where a non-judge character tried to use a judge's weapon, and predictably, it did not work out well for them. Like, yeah, you'd think the criminal element would have figured that out by it now. It seems like you've got to know better. No, because that's a thing from the last movie. That, that's a thing from the 1994 movie. And from the comics. I'm not sure And how... from all of the comics. Yeah, okay, you well, don't I'm handle not sure a judge's gun. i not this we're considering is fair game here. It, that it's been out for three weeks. It's all it's fair game. Okay. Potentially not even in most theaters uh, anymore. I figure our recommendation would probably be yeah. to watch it on a home video version, DVD or Blu-ray or what have you. Which I gotta say, the movie was fun enough that I'm definitely planning on picking up on bl- picking it up on Blu-ray as soon as it comes out. It's pretty good looking. Like, right? It it was enjoyable. The 3D slow motion effects actually serve a point in the narrative, which is kind of unique for a movie. Mm-hmm. Like, no, all of the 3D slow-mo effects are explained. There's a drug. You take it. It slows everything down to 1% normal speed. Makes total sense. And it was well done, although I have to admit that... Everything is so shiny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, suddenly lens flare lens just flare shoots up everywhere. The... They could have just called the drug flare. That gives me really terrible um, gastrointestinal distress-related mental images. Flaming farts. So yeah, the drug. Um, but like, all, all of the scenes are justified. It's just used to highlight the extreme brutality of this movie that, yeah, 
you actually watch a bullet enter the close side of a guy's face just off camera, only to exit and then explode out the other side. Moments. You later. know the scene at the very end of 300 where the spear goes through Xerxes' cheek? It's like that, except for ten times and through the skull instead of the cheek. Yeah, that, that's got nothing on the things that happen in this movie, dear god. <laughs> it was awesome. And kind of gross. A little bit disturbing, even for, like, uh, someone who sat through all seven of the Saw movies. Like, this was graphic. Like, I was not prepared for some of the things that yeah, happened in this movie. I was kind of expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, but not quite this. Like... I, I could get from the trailers that this was going to be kind of gritty and whatever, but... Flat out... Bru- this was not what I was expecting. Yeah, flat out brutally gory. Like, it's true to the comics, like, not... as true as can be. Because, let, let's face it, those of you who uh, actually read the 82,000 comic, they don't hold back. No, those are nasty. Those are Those are brutal, violent comics. And Judge Dredd is not a nice character in a universe where things work out just because you're a nice person. Like, no, that that's not the point of these stories. Oh, one thing I really want to point out is that made this tonally appropriate is that a whole bunch of crazy stuff happens in this movie. Like, a giant housing unit is nearly destroyed, and tons of people die, and and both of the lead characters are very close to death several times. But the ending of the movie wraps up with the idea that this is just another Tuesday in Mega City 1. This was not like an event. Oh, yeah. This is just, you know, this is regular business. This is how things go in Mega City 1. Well, the, the director of this film flat out said that, yeah, if we make $50 million, there will be a sequel. There will be more of these. Problem being that this it, didn't it's, do all that Yeah, well. it's questionable if we're going to make $50 million. I'm not surprised by that. No, th- this is going to be the kind of movie that does really, really well in DVD sales. That That's exactly the kind of movie this is. Wikipedia is putting their box office at 21.6 million with a budget of 45. I'm compl- God. I'm completely not surprised. Like, th- this isn't the kind of movie that draws a mass audience. Car- uh, IMDb says the budget's estimated at 50 million. Yep. Similar. In any case, they lost their shorts making this movie, apparently. Yeah, no question. A lot. That's a shame. But, uh, again, the majority of a movie's sales don't come short-term box office anymore. The majority of sales, like, a film actually has a lifetime sales statistic now. Sure. Things have changed. There's digital downloads, which help. There's DVD and Blu-ray sales. All of these things contribute just as much to a film's total gross and getting the contributors their money back as initial box office. And this is a type of movie that it was destined to have a long tail because the previous installment in the license was terrible, and so it will take some word of mouth to recover the name. But, and, and yet then... it's still watched. Like, people still remember that movie. Yes, people do. Like I'm willing to bet the that Dread saw a or the release of Dread saw a spike in the sales of Sylvester Stallone's Judge Dread on DVD, which I'm sure you could get for like three dollars. I shudder to think you're probably right, but I don't like it. <laughs> no, it wasn't a great movie. And I'm sorry to say, but uh, Rob Schneider, you kill everything you touch. This is why we can't have nice yeah, things. We're gonna get a. Le- we're gonna get a letter from Rob Schneider now. I, you know, I would, I would frame and mount that on my wall. If Honestly, I, I want my money back for going to see the animal in theaters. Is that yep. something you want to admit to and have that posted on the internet? I was young you at the that? time, <laughs> and the chick from Survivor was hot. Fair eh, can't argue. You can't, you can't argue with that. Reality TV stars, we hardly knew you. So, there were a lot of mythology gags in this movie. And there was a lot of things referencing the comic, and also things that are not in the comic. Because 
there is I Am The Law came up, which is a notorious Judge Dredd song. It needed to be there it once. Had to be in yep. there. And it was. It was snarled with authority. But then I also blinked at, you have 15 seconds to comply, which made me immediately think of Robocops, you have 10 seconds to comply. Right. Which is also getting remade in the near future. When you think about it, Judge Dredd and Robocop are very similar universes. They... Yeah, old Detroit is very similar to Mega City Faceless Walk. characters with brutal murder and extreme law enforcement measures. Yeah, no, they're, they're very similar universes. Speaking of Robocop, I don't know if you saw the release of uh, The Dark Knight Returns, the most recent DC animated release that came out last week. I did not. Peter Weller is doing the voice of Bruce Wayne. In the Whoa. Movie. This Robocop. Yeah. We're, we're apparently dropping... Uh, I, God, I can't remember the name of the voice actor who does uh, the, the classic animated Batman. Like, Kane, I think is the last name. Whatever. It, it's weird hearing Peter Weller's voice coming out of Bruce Wayne, coming out of the bat suit. That seems like it's an interesting choice. I can support it. Yeah, I, I, will, I will give credit. I don't think that you need to have the same voice actors for everything. I, I think that only cheapens the experience of, well, it can only ever be this guy. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, other people will be able to do the Joker just as well as Mark Hamill. Give them time. Peter Weller actually strikes me as kind of similar to Mark Hamill, because Mark Hamill has the one um, role that everybody recognizes him as, which is Luke yeah. Skywalker. But then secretly, he is every voice actor that has ever voice acted, even the female ones. Yep. Pixie, has Peter Weller been anything else? Uh, he has a fairly substantial filmography that I see on Wikipedia, but it's mostly Robocop and just tiny miscellaneous things. Uh, a lot of TV guest yeah. appearances that are often uncredited. Like, I, I knew he's Robocop. He, he seems like a really great actor. God, I actually remember the movie Screamers. That, that in fact, was a thing. So, I want to put forth a theory that... The voice of Batman in Batman the Dark Knight Returns. Yep, that's what we're talking about. Pretty awesome. Someone decided to take the Frank Miller comic that nearly killed Batman and make I'm an animated still film about to it. Wrap my head around that. That we don't have our classic Bruce Wayne voice, despite him probably being available. Heck, you. Is Adam West still working? <laughs> yeah, Family Guy's still being made. It just. Yeah, I was gonna say. Just get Adam West for, to do it. For decades, he's just been. Oddly enough, living off of making fun of himself. Yeah, oddly enough, I'd be okay with that. So, I would like to put the, forth the theory that the female main character of Dread, the rookie, was introduced in the screenwriting process based on the motivation that, okay, because of mythology gags, we need to sh not show Dread's face. Because Justice is faceless and he yeah. is Justice. And... That's the role. So someone needs to take but, the role of... The well, no, it was very obvious to character. me over the course of exposition that she exists as the audience insert to yeah. have everything explained to her. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> she, she's it's the just, new set were... of eyes so that they can reasonably explain everything. Yeah, it's just it was just very obvious. I don't know. I, I did like the exchanges between her and Dredd, especially the one regarding her helmet. It just had that nice black Mega City One style. Yeah, that humor. was pretty awesome. But then I was kind of annoyed at the very end where she's holding a helmet under her arm because it's like, wait, you're changing your mind? Which is more important? Well, she also changed her mind about joining the Force, so I don't know how that goes. Dred's like, she's approved as she's walking away. Like, what does that mean? Does that well, mean she's. Because he didn't tell her, I don't know. Yeah, does that mean she's flat out gonna quit and, like,. Walk to the nearest fast food chain and be like, I'd like an application. I think if the Justice Department wants you to be a judge, you become a judge. I, I don't think that's really optional in Mega City 1. Yeah, I don't know if they let judges No. Quit. Semper Fi is forever, as is mentioned in Axton's 
tape in Borderlands 2. So they have to kill you. Are, are we ready to jump topics? No, no, not then? at all. <laughs> I, I wanted, There's two things I want to cover about the rookie. One of which is, I, I guess my objective favorite scene, surpassing the one where the homeless dude is crushed, is the one where the traitor judges are going after the rookie. And she's just like, I'm psychic. I know your traitor judges. I'm psychic. And so the, the, way, the way it plays out in the movie is that the scene is like 30 seconds long. Is the, Not the even. one judge goes yeah. after the rookie, and the rookie is like looks at her, and there's a little bit of vignetting on the screen, like there is when she's using her powers, but there's not even any imagery suggesting what she's picking up. Just a yeah, tiny she just bit of vignetting, she just and then she pulls out her gun, shoots the traitor it. judge, and walks off frame, and that's it. They don't address it anymore. They don't explain it. Yeah. It's just really quick and awesome. Well, countering the traitor judge's claim that oh, she's gonna spot me hesitate for a second when she sees another judge and then I'll just shoot her. Nope. Psychic. So, Why would she I just stop? handled that situation and it was pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, which, you know. Uh, I kind of wanted to see more exposition on... I hated that she needed to be rescued. She did need to be rescued a lot. Yeah. I, I wanted to see I more wanted exposition on the, the conflict between you're a mutant and so... All of society hates you. Like, there was graffiti on walls. Like, uh, muties must die. Like, it's clear that these people aren't welcome in society. And yet you're serving them. Okay. So, either the explanation is you wanted to be a judge just so that you can shoot the people who hate you. Or... You actually want to make this place uh, better but for them. But she's portrayed as a fairly sincere optimist. Uh, she's she actually cares about justice is what it is it seems. Uh, the, they do mention that most muties wind up with a third arm out of their forehead, and you did pretty well by your mutations. Mm -hmm. uh, Pixie, do you want? Yeah, I wanted to see some of those mutants. Uh, I guess. Oh, I was trying to. Go ahead. <laughs> so it 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 seems like there's a lot of setup where. We need to have her be captured or something, have Anderson be captured or something so that we have an, a loosely structured excuse for Dread to go on a rampage. I think only the once. I think she was At only... At least twice. She was only actually kidnapped once. She got in a bad spot another time, but Dread wasn't far away at that point. And... So, yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was just so that they could have an excuse to have him go on a rampage, but... Yeah. It's still kind of like, oh, well, great. I, it, it's unfortunate that she was a female character and that had and that happened. I think even uh, if, what's more unfortunate is the, you know, implications of sexual violence. Yeah, I was I, I had some kind of suggestions about what happened. this would be from Pixie before I saw the movie. So, the the before this section of the movie starts, there's like Dread has a line that is if things go south you might want to keep the last bullet in your gun for yourself. And I was like, well, okay, this might be a reference to the skinning and slow-mo and dropping off the top of the building. I was like, I'm, I'm optimistic about this. And then, nope, it was a reference to sexual assault. I was like, come on. Couldn't it have just been mundane torture? Bored. This is dumb. Yeah, exactly. That's the People would not have written it that way for a male character. All right. And you, you would think from the perspective of the... They don't the, actually go through with her being assaulted like that. It's implied that it's really, really likely and a distinct possibility. But at but, the same time, the villain of the story actually discourages uh, it through direct right. command. In this one situation. Uh, for the reason that they want because to disguise from judge. the Justice Department the nature of the right. incident. Yeah. You would, you would think She's from the perspective of the... specific incident, don't do that. Well, in the perspective of the narrative, this character being a former prostitute and a, a victim of assault, that she would discourage that amongst her men to begin with. Then why would she specify it in I, this I, one? That she had to. Like, I'm, I'm saying it's a weakness in the story here. <laughs> That that should have easily been a character point to make the except character of Mama is, except more interesting. Mama isn't exactly an empathetic person, so right. She she's a cold-hearted psychopath mm. by all means. It, 
<laughs> her solution of these people aren't doing their jobs properly is let's skin them and throw them off the top floor of this building. Well, they're addled on drugs. Clearly she's not all there in her HR department. I, I kind of feel like it would so, have been yeah, a, that, that was... a bit of a higher stakes situation in general if it was the same threat of very gory, painful oh, death for lies. Dread as well as yeah. the rookie. Bah. No, I I was disappointed uh, in it's, the performance of the when, former It's just judges. that when they want to show that a woman's in deep crap, then yeah, they, that, all, that's they the always card they pull out to. the sexual assault threat card. Right. And that bothers me in ways that... Yeah, without a doubt. I want... Dread was not under that same kind no, of threat. No, he was not. Would have been interesting if it had been. Like, there's a card you just don't see often. Okay, let's see where this goes. And, um, this is the kind of movie where it would not be impossible for main characters to just be tortured to death, and that's the end of the movie. Yeah. So I'm not going to lie, that could have been a thing in this. The, you don't have to go that far for knowing that that is a realistic threat in this universe to create tension. And then, to circle way back around to the part about the rookie being rescued, um, there is a scene where Judge Dredd gets shot through the torso and is out of ammo with a gun to his head, and then the rookie has to come rescue him and patch him up. Yeah, that scene, I felt, was kind of weak. It was kind of honest. rushed, yeah. Yeah, that was... Like, Dr Dredd's line to hold the guy for a second is, Wait. And then he goes into a villain's monologue for like 30 seconds before that the rookie seems... finally lines up a shot and blows his head off. Like, that that was just awkward, I think. And, and could have been written And back. kind of inconsistent with the universe. There's actually a number of things that happen in this movie where you have the opportunity to kill your enemy, but you don't just immediately kill them. And that's not how 2008 works. Which is, which is, you just kill people. Yeah, which is kind of... Someone's in front of you, yeah, you kill them. Of... Pyro. <laughs> um, which is what makes that scene that you mentioned before with Anderson just instantaneously reading the traitor judge and dispatching her appropriately, air quotes appropriately, that's what makes that, that so That makes tight, it an amazing scene. Is that it just yeah. happens. Versus the guy who's got and, and Dredd, we don't have, the we don't, Judge Dredd in yeah, front Yeah, we don't of. have this little, um, we don't have the little exchange of, oh, no, I'm on your side, and no, you're not. And there's no, like, back and forth, it's just, nope. <laughs> it's just very tight, very cleanly shot, and sure. done. And so that's, the scene where Dredd was rescued would have been more interesting if Dredd was unconscious, and then, and then Anderson comes and kills Lex, and then does the medical procedure herself, instead of Dredd patching himself up. Yeah, I... I almost wanted to see that judge try to pull off Dredd's helmet before he got shot. That would have been cool, too. Right? Like, don't let Do it come like off. Do, like, a because... Batman fake out That would have been amazing. That would have been like a luchador demasking scene. And then you cut it off with Anderson intervening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been great. In Clearly instead somebody we... should have had his own <laughs> Instead <laughs> we've got... Wait. And then 30 seconds of villain. There monologue. is a lot of villain monologue shot. there. I... I, 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 I that at even 40 seconds. Oh my god. That, that was just... That scene bothered me. It, it was definitely a weak point. But, overall, let, let's sum it up. Dread was really Good enjoyable. Movie. Yeah. It, it is a fun, gory action fest made for fans of the original work. Like, the... But, by contrast, the Sylvester Stallone Judge Dread almost seems like satire. Of the Judge Dredd universe. It it seems like a comedy written in this universe. When you frame it that way, that almost Honestly, makes the Sylvester Stallone movie sound interesting to me. Right. Well, that's, that's kind of how I had internalized like, it, I'm going to be I, honest. I had gone back and watched the Nostalgia Critics review of, uh, of Judge Dredd. May he rest in peace. That, um, that interpretation makes and, it sound yeah, like Starship Troopers to me. Because the original book, yeah, Starship that, Troopers, was like. like a super fascist wet dream. And then 2000 AD is kind of a pro-fascism wet dream. And so if you wanted to write yeah. some anti-fascist vitriol, 
then writing a parody in the Judge Dredd universe would be a good way to do it. Well, both of them are really satires of that genre. I mean, Starship Troopers was written as a a complete satire just looking at the ridiculousness of these pro-war, pro-fascist uh, regimes. Yeah. And it just happens to, ha- to take the guise of an action movie where you kill bugs. The distinction is that the Star Trek Troopers movie has much better production values and is way funnier. Yeah, like All I said, Rob, stuff got really heavy in here. Rob Schneider just kind of kills the humor of everything he's involved in. Impressive for a comedian. <laughs> I'm using air quotes with comedian, by the way. Um, t- things you lose in radio. Why don't we do a TV show? Oh, yeah, no studio. This will be corrected for in the next, like, couple of years, hopefully. Sometime. <laughs> continuing. So, continuing. Yeah, if you watch Judge Dredd as a satire of Dredd, it actually becomes an enjoyable movie. <laughs> That's very interesting. I I might have to actually revisit it on that basis. I was totally against right? it at the beginning of this show, but you've turned me around. Yeah, just watch it as comedy satire, and it's brilliant. It It's taking everything that the Dread universe is and making fun of it. So if you were on the fence about seeing Dread or you kind of wanted to go, you should probably see it. Do it. If, if it's already left theaters near you, by all means, pick it up on DVD. Have fun with it. It, it is a good gory mess and is an excellent way to get into the Dread universe if you have any interest. It's still going on. The only disappointment I had in Dread outside of the weakness of the one scene we discussed, no ABC <laughs> I, I wanted my giant evil robot somewhere in there, and it totally could have been in there as like, yeah, Mama found this thing in a dumpster and fixed it up as her personal guard. I still think the Cooking Mama crossover really needs to happen. Someone needs to make that art. Please, somebody make that reference. It'd be meth Cooking Mama. Cooking Ma- Cooking Mama makes slow-mo. You mixed the batch wrong. You killed half the city. Oops! Mama's disapproval means someone that has such a horrible subtext now. Mama's disapproval means you get skinned and thrown off the top floor of a building. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> so continuing, we've got news! Indeed. So today was announced... I guess that depends on whether or not we put out this episode today. That would be kind of crazy. Possibly in the past. Possibly in the future. Depends on you. Time travel. It's amazing. <laughs> So, Mass Effect 3 announced today its new Retaliation multiplayer DLC. No charge. It's going to be coming out October 9th. Uh, Or in our Time Traveler's edition, it came out October 9th. um, The trailer we watched just before the show looks awesome and badass. But it it kind of goes through everything really quickly, so we're going to do a little breakdown. Um... The big, big, big deal about this is new enemies. We have a fourth enemy type to deal with. The Collectors. So you've got the Praetorian, the Scion, the Abomination, the Trooper, and the Captain. Works like the previous modes. You get little sparse groups of each uh, during a wave, and there's a big one coming later. Um, A couple of new enemy types added to Cerberus added the Dragoon, and the Geth are adding new drones. Great. Let's just make Geth harder to deal with. Uh, new character classes for the players. Including so, ones with jetpacks. The Turian Havoc Soldier and Ghost Infiltrator. Yup. It seems like just the I right amount of stuff to mix up the multiplayer, dropping at just the right time. Because the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer right. has had really long legs, but it's... Like, like, the minute I think I'm done with the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, they're like, here's new cool stuff! Come on back. And it's free, which it's like, is like... Damn it, I was going to cancel my Xbox Live subscription. Nope, not happening, buddy. No, I don't get to. You're stuck with me. Uh, well, That's yeah. the power of playing on PC. For... Except for the fact that I have no friends on PC. <laughs> okay, so... New hazard versions of existing maps. Um, 
So they're going to be adding environmental hazards and traps. Uh, I personally am looking forward to the exploding quarry and baby trap. Let's see. Quote, a regular rotation of fire bases will be introduced to different hazards as they come under attack. Survive the onslaught of acid, lightning, meltdown, sandstorm, swarms, and whiteouts. Okay, the whiteout sounds ridiculously cool. But the question is, do the environmental effects also affect the enemies, or is it just a negative penalty for you? Like, I'd imagine I, it would involve more strategy if, I, if, if both. I'm going to be really, really frustrated if I step onto a map that's experiencing whiteout, knowing that my vision is limited, but my enemies are still going to shoot with sniper precision through the snow. You know what I can pretty much guarantee you sight unseen? It depends on the difficulty level. I hope so. Yeah. Platinum is like, we, we can totally shoot through a complete blizzard. It's fine. It's fine. We'll, we'll detect you in their spawning point. It's fine. Uh, new weapons, obviously, because, you know, the collectors get their own freaking weapons. New difficulty. I can still barely play gold. Like, I'm comfortable on silver. The moment you put me on gold, I need a 100% good team or I'm done. Mm -hmm. I, right. I can't imagine what platinum's like. You took a bullet, all of your health exploded, and all of your shields for all of your characters. Like, even the ones you're not playing as. Their shields just went <laughs> down. Yeah, it just deletes your uh, weapon arsenal every time you take any damage. It's permanent yes. death. <laughs> Actually, that sounds kind of cool. Like... Have a mode of the game set up that gives like quadruple experience, but the moment your character actually dies at the end of a mission, you're Hardcore done. Mode. That's it. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Hi, are you listening? No, not <laughs> at all. Shut up! They might like our podcast. Well, I, I figure Dr. Greg They're and Dr. Ray aren't as busy anymore. Games. They need some things to listen to while they're brewing their craft beers and doing charity in South Africa. I'm going to hope that sounds clear in the recorded and posted version. Me too. Uh, your signal's breaking up a lot, uh, It will sound clear because it's a local recording. Mm -hmm. It's internet. Yep. Okay. I'm gonna anyway, go, so go you ahead. get um, See if that helps. new ammo mods and upgrades to your equipment, stuff like that. There's also they're also adding a whole new feature uh, called multiplayer challenges, um, which gives you challenge points, and you'll unlock titles and banners. So just Basically, little extra things little to do like during the mission. Pseudo achievements, kind of things. Which we need on a system that already has real achievements. I don't know, well, I mean, it, getting, like, badass ranks. Right, it, it's a nice different. way for them to reward you for doing various things. It sounds very free-to-play. So. It, it, it tracks in-game statistics, like, you know, how long you've been playing is right. Which, a yeah, particular class. It, if they're running um, this the way they are, it sounds like they're basically trying to turn it... Scoring a certain number of points with a certain class. Yeah. It, it sounds like they're trying to turn this almost into an MMO shooter... And that's really cool. Because that's what you're going to need to do if you're going to keep the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer running. So, You have to give more incentives for continuing to play. They already have their micropayment monetization thing where you can do the gun lottery. And they have systems where you get the same things you'd pay for by putting time into the game. Which is the free-to-play model, except that it comes in a box... What if they pull, like, a Team Fortress 2 eventually, and are just like, okay, now you the multiplayer client for Mass Effect 3 is free? That would be fantastic. Especially, It would still work on uh, Xbox Live, where you're still paying a subscription fee for the overall that's service. Pay, being paid to Microsoft, right. not to Bioware. But I, I'd actually want to see them open it up where it's no longer a random gun pack. I would like to be able to unlock the things that I want sure. to use. Because that's the frustration I'm still having, where it's, yeah, I I really only use this one assault rifle, because it's, it's, it's what I, works um, for me, I actually, and yet I've only got rank one of it. I actually bought Microsoft, like $25 worth of Microsoft points. Just to throw into... Just to throw into points, trying to unlock new characters, and... Uh, and you just don't get them. 
No, I'm just not being angry. I've been getting gun upgrades. And I'm like, yeah, that's uh, kind of a right. really bad like, system. I, I would love to be able to, I just, to unlock I the to things I want. I, I want I, I'm looking at this going, look at all these new classes. I'd like to be able to try and play one. Right. Like, I got lucky and I unlocked the turret, or not the turret, the uh, Vorcha's Soldier, which is something I really, really wanted to play as. I also unlocked the uh, Batarian Soldier. Two of the classes, or two of the new races yeah, see, for the I, class I, that I, I love. I still haven't managed to unlock a whole bunch of those new races, and not for lack of trying. Right. You would think at this point, unlocking a market so that, yeah, you've got so many points, maybe, just you know, buy maybe the gun cost, you want. Maybe make it cost more yeah. than it would to buy the random pack. Like, they, they could really run the League of Legends model here, where, yeah, you can have them for so many points that you get for playing the game, which they've already got that system in place, or you could spend so many Microsoft points on them and get the same content. Pixie's inability to get the extra classes is really a tragedy in two ways, because one, it's a bad uh, free-to-play system where now she is discouraged from spending money because it seems like there's no value proposition because, yeah. there. Because she's not getting the luck of the draw to unlock the and things she wants. And then the other thing is that they've made all of this content, so they've already invested the development money, but now either, even their dedicated customers don't get to experience it. That's a waste. Yeah, that, that's the problem I'm having with continuing the system, and that's why I haven't been playing it. Why well, I'd rather go to League of Legends, where I'm rewarded for the time that I play by being able to buy the things that I want. It, it sounds like a great model, just, yeah, you, you get random stuff, and it's cool when you unlock things, you get like five items. But if you're not getting the items you want, you're not going to want to keep playing. Like, I tried for almost two months just to get the assault rifle that works for me, the one that I use in single player. I still haven't gotten another upgrade for it. I've got weapons that are like already level 10, and my primary weapon, the one that I depend on the most, is still level 1. Well, that's unfortunate. But on the plus side, this DLC is free, so hey, pretend it was $15 and put that in the slot machine. <laughs> this DLC is free. Good luck getting any of the new things. Oh, what, what he's saying is, you know, put the money that you would right. think, expect that you would have spent on it towards... Towards Microsoft it. points. Yeah. And I yeah. hope that you get some new stuff. But, um... Well, typically when they put out these packs, don't they actually have, like, a pack that only contains new items? Like, I remember that in the Resurgence. There was just a Resurgence pack that is, yeah, you're guaranteed to have one of the new things in here. That's a thought. I don't know. We'll see. This doesn't come out for another couple days, so... A five, to be specific. Or possibly it's already out, depending on when you're listening. I don't think it's going to take us that long to put out this episode. Greetings, people in the future. I hope you enjoy your insect overlords. Really? Insects? I, for one, yeah, welcome but... our new insect overlords. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Microsoft has announced a new streaming music service, branded Xbox Music. That'll be coming out on October 26th. It's going to have a free ad-supported streaming service that would be uh, kind of Pandora or Spotify style. And then there will also be a subscription plan that is um, probably going to roll up the current Zune Music Pass thing and just be rebranded as Xbox Music, but have maybe a larger library and some new software to go along with it. And while it is called Xbox Music, it is actually going to be available for Windows Phone, Windows 8, and Xbox. So, I guess if you have a PC with the new Windows operating system, you will have the opportunity to use the Microsoft Music Streaming Service that is potentially not as good as other music streaming services. No price is announced, but... This is this whole thing of Microsoft wanting to create the total media platform. Right. Where, yes, we control your gaming, we control your music, we control your movies. Like The, the next gaming system isn't so much going to be a gaming system as a media platform. Right. And Microsoft has gotten some bad coverage lately for not using the Xbox dashboard to promote downloadable games that are available for purchase but instead just constantly using it for movie trailers and other non-game media. Yeah, I don't know. I've been turning on my Xbox lately, and I've been seeing political ads. Yeah, that too. 
It's like, I don't think I want to get my political news from my gaming platform. On one hand, it's kind of cool because well, I believe that it was possible to stream the presidential debate live from the Xbox dashboard with one click. And I'm truly wondering about the people who are doing that, though, and the ones who just turn it on because they wanted to play Cod Blops. That there is, like, probably a very small number of people who were just going to play Call of Duty, but saw it was there one click away, and they're like, okay, I guess I'll watch the presidential debate, and then they hit the button, actually, and then they get informed. There was actually, as I recall, Microsoft had an incentive for watching the debate via Xbox Live. Um, it was like an avatar thing or something. Okay, that's kind of cool. So that yeah. is like social uh, activism, and good on Microsoft, because... Here we go. It was Xbox Live rewards members in the rewards programs. It's uh, who watch at least three of the upcoming ep uh, debates on their Xbox 360s will get the Halo 4 Warrior avatar out. Okay, I. If anything is going to convince gamers that they so need, need to, to watch, watch at least ads, three out of the four. Yep, one October. one's already over, so this is news for you. If you want to get this avatar, you need to watch the other ones and sign up for their rewards program, which I think is just like one button click. Yeah, it's pretty simple. I, I think you just go on. Besides, that helps you earn. You, you get like Microsoft points for like using the stuff, so it's kind of ah. cool. It's like you know, you spend so much time. It, Netflix, it right? sounds like a great idea. And we're gonna, you know, give you like a couple points here for taking a quick poll. Or something. I, I want the Halo Couch Potato skin for watching like a hundred hours of Netflix. <laughs> no, like you get like actual Microsoft points via rewards, which is sweet. Let me. That's not a bad deal at all. And I mean, right? theoretically, I... the gamer demographic includes a lot of young people. Uh, not all gamers are young people, but basically all young people are gamers, and so this has the opportunity to reach a lot of people who are traditionally less involved with the political process and get yeah, them involved. I, I imagine that even for the gamers who aren't of age to vote, like, just making them informed of, hey, these are the people who are running for president, kind of a big deal. Like, even just doing that seems to be a valid use of Xbox's bandwidth. Absolutely. And I know Pixie and I were both very excited when we got to vote in our first election, and we had spent a while before that getting ready, and it was an event. <laughs> I, I was instructed to vote or be disowned by my family, so they didn't tell me wh what way I had to vote, but they said you're voting. Vote or, you know that scene in Judge Dredd with the bullets through the face? Yeah, it'll be that. We're, we're doing that to you. So, uh, shall we continue to League news? Sure. So, starting tomorrow, kind of a big deal, the end of Season 2, the playoffs begin. OMG! And to commemorate, uh, they will be marketing the Championship Riven skin, which is being given for free to anyone who attends the finals or is available for purchase with RP during the event. Y you know, it's, it's an improvement from the last Riven costume. I'll definitely say that. Is that setting the bar terribly high? So, like, you uh, get 20 points con for doing Considering the, la the last one was Bunny Ribbon, so... <laughs> that is setting the bar very low. Yes, but Championship Ribbon looks very, very cool. It's a limited time skin. Um... I don't really play Ribbon, so there's actually another promotional thing that I'm way more excited about, and that is yep. there are new summoner pictures. I bet Pixie will yep. also be excited about this, because she has what? vocally disapproved of the selection of summoner pictures in so the yes. past. If you have a favorite team that is going to the finals that you would like to root for, you can now set their logo as your summoner icon. So right now, mine is proudly rocking Moscow 5. Mine well, is my TSM. Favorite, as most people's are, because TSM is pro. Um... While Moscow 5 may not always be my favorite team, I will give respect to anyone that says, you know what, we're going to play this game our way and forget the way people are telling you that you have to. CLG is not in these finals, but if it was, I would totally be wearing the CLG logo because of their participation in the I Just Played Jax music video. That's <laughs> enough to earn my loyalty. Can I just have a Jax icon? Like, literally, that's, that's all I care about. Just a barren face. Yep. Actually, I've been playing more Jace lately, because he's hilarious. Jace is kind of the new Jax, in terms of being really OP. 
He he does everything forever when he wants to. I can jungle, I can mid, I can support, which admitted that was a weird game. Um, but yes, the, the upcoming finals are uh, starting tomorrow, and to uh, help promote, they have created a mobile app, Ooh. which will inform you of when player matches are starting. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you the ability to, say, stream the match from your phone, but uh, just the ability to know when a match is going on is kind of awesome. Very much. Like, I think that's an amazing... Uh, bit of showmanship from the uh, from Riot. That, yeah, you're a fan of our series? Dude, here's here's an app that will tell you and remind you when a game is going on. I think it even will post results uh, Very when cool. they're available. Now, if only they would buy LOL replays and integrate it into the client. I have a feeling that's going to be a thing for Season 3, as well as a large selection of character nerfs. Um, yeah, it I'm interested in seeing just what kind of major changes are in store for Season 3. Like, they flat out said that they're revising a lot of the items. Just flat out removing some and either nerfing or buffing others to provide a more dynamic game experience. Likewise, they're going to be doing that with a lot of the popular champions. Uh, most of the professional picks are going to be changed in some way. Like, they pretty much said if any champion is being seen as pick or ban 50% of the time, that champion can expect a change. Seems reasonable. As, yeah, that sounds like the best means to balance and fine-tune your game, that, hey, this champion's either picked or banned a lot. In a game where only ten people get to pick champs, seeing one constantly picked or banned is a sign that this is a really powerful character, maybe we need to tweak them to bring them in line with the other characters to make them more viable choices. Season 3 brings many uncertain things, but we can all be sure about one thing. Irelia will be nerfed. Always. Always and forever. I, I would almost... Mostly because Morello hates her. I would be comfortable if Irelia just becomes a joke and is just, and is just nerfed forever. Her stats just continue to decrease every patch for the remainder they, of the game. They, they've kind of done that. That's what they did to Evelyn. Back when they ruled that, yeah, this character is not fun for new players. We need to do something about her. That hasn't stopped Shaco from being Shaco. They haven't really tweaked Shaco the way they tweaked Evelyn in so much as utterly destroying her. Right. Well, I'm suggesting that perhaps Shaco needs the Evelyn treatment. Uh, Shaco's uh, dealable. But uh, yeah, they're, they're going to be talking to the player community. They're going to be actively monitoring things all in line for Season 3. Like Right now, all they're doing is hotfix changes to champs uh, for the time that you know they can monitor what's going on. Like Rengar had to receive a minor hotfix. He was just too powerful after his recent set of buffs. They fixed that, but otherwise they're not doing any major tweaks to characters until Season 3 is over. So, I have never really watched much streaming league or league casting. Uh, do you have any places to watch streams or replays that you recommend? Well, they are now actually running a program called The Summoner Spotlight. Way to prompt there. Which allows you to view recommended champ er, uh, summoners that are, as quoted by Riot, exemplary models of the ideal summoner's code. People who just uh, can show not only top-level gameplay, but top-level sportsmanship. Ah. Who, who won't necessarily be broadcasting, oh yeah, I dominated this enemy team, I'm putting them into the dirt so hard, but even when they're losing, will represent what the ideal league player is. It, uh, to that regard, they've also introduced a new system into the game called the Honor System. I noticed that I got a helpful point when I logged into League the other day. That would probably have been me. <laughs> um, this allows teammates and opponents to grant a non, uh, non-commodity non token to a particularly either helpful or friendly teammate or enemy upon the completion of a game. 
So while the points don't actually mean anything, they're just something to collect, it is it has actually seen a vast improvement in the behavior of League opponents. The idea that, well, if I behave well, even though I lost, I could still be uh, respected in this regard. Pretty cool. I mean, that is yeah. a nice change of pace from the fact that every game is like, report person for intentional feeding even though they were not intentionally feeding and we're just wasting the right. tribunal's time. Just happen to maybe not play as well as you would hope. Like, that's not a punishable offense. Instead of punishing that person, why not honor the six people who played well, didn't whine about losing, and were actually fun opponents? That seems... Like, I, I found myself honoring opponents more than I have teammates just because some of them are actually really cool people to chat with. And while I may not put them on my friends list, they're still good people. Yeah, and I don't really like to have too many people on my friends list, especially people I don't know too well, so this is a great right. way to strike that balance if there's a good I, person. I run into that on Xbox Live a lot, where I'm like, I have no idea who half these people are. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've still got a couple people on my Steam and Xbox Live friends list that I'm like, I played one game of a game I don't play anymore with these people, why are these still on my friends list? Well, it's not just, it's not that because it's like, well, I mean, any game that I'm, I've played online, I'm probably still on, at least a little bit. Like, I'm, I'm actively but. looking at my Steam friends list, and I, I have a guy who is on constantly, who I recall I played one game of Left 4 Dead 2 with, one time, like, two years ago, and has, have not done a thing or interacted with this person since. So while well, it's just I, I I get to the point where I'm like I forget which one you are type of thing. Like I've added a whole bunch of people that I've you know met through the Rooster Teeth website, mm -hmm. and then it's like, which one are you again? Yeah. Oh, there's some. I can't remember which it is, but I've encountered a friends list system which allowed you to save a note along with the friend. And yeah, you, like, can do that in, you can do that in League of Legends. Okay, that's an amazing system because yeah. I yeah, have the same problem with Dixie. I remember World of Warcraft used to let you do that, and so I did that mm -hmm. constantly. Uh, I also did, uh, even if it's just, is a really cool dude, <laughs> would be my note, but... Yeah, I'll, I keep notes on what positions people on my friends list that I don't necessarily interact with in real life like to play. So I know that if this person invites me to a game... I should not expect to be playing that position. Because this other person clearly likes it more. Indeed. So, you're saying that if I'm watching casters, I'm probably going to watch people who are also primarily players. Uh, I'm kind of coming from the StarCraft II background, were you? and I watched a lot of HD and Husky, who were basically just casters, and yeah. they played the game, but they were not really notable for their playing. No, it, it's understandable. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, like, totally a thing. I'm, I, I'm still an enormous fan of Day9 and enjoy everything he does. I, I wish he did more League stuff, because I imagine it would be hilarious. Oh. Right, absolutely. For Day9 example, is great. Yeah, I, I tend to... I, I, can, I can keep up when we're going to the Marvel vs. Capcom 3 tournaments or whatever at the Ghost, for example. Mm-hmm. I'm not very good at this game, but I'm totally competent as a spectator. <laughs> right. So that's actually kind of what I was looking for for League. Right. Is I want to watch YouTube videos of a caster who's analyzing the game. I, I and kind not of actually it. have more fun watching uh, just replays. At, at least as much fun as I do actually playing the game. And in fact, we're doing it right now. I, I'm currently watching a. A, uh, a non-pro game that I've just picked up through the random um, spectate mode. My conclusion, Fed Chogath, ridiculous. Fed Chogath is a funny phrase because it can mean two things. Chogath has his consume ability that builds stacks. And so it, it, he goes nom 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 and he eats things. But then also he kills you and gets gold. And... But yeah, there, there are a few channels that they have highlighted. Uh, Ocelot World is always a good one. Uh, Ocelot is one of the rising European players. I, I actually think he does play on Moscow 5. Um, I'm probably wrong about that. Um, but his 
I've watched him a couple times, and he is monumentally enjoyable. They actually just highlighted him with a video on the main site that does contain a link to his personal page. He actually does give away skins during his uh, during his shows, where if you go to his Facebook, uh, you can actually enter the code that he's just going to post and get a skin. And then you have to be undeniably fast. Uh, he also does, like, quizzes and surveys to earn skins. Cool. Apparently pro players just, like, get piles of skins. That makes sense. And that is... They, they're cheaper than money, for Riot at least. Yep, and you can give them away as prizes without having to worry about things like taxes. Indeed. So, yeah. That's a thing. Cliff Blazinski, also known as the real Cliffy B, uh, one of the creators of Gears of War, is leaving Epic Games. So, there's a lot of people leaving a lot of very big game companies lately. Right? I'm kind of wondering what's going on in the game industry. I'm like, I'm half expecting an announcement that Gabe Nua leaves Valve. <laughs> oh no! E even that even though he has flat out said that he would rather dissolve the company than be bought out. I, I think if Gabe N stopped working at Valve, then Reddit would stop working. There just wouldn't be any more Reddit. Gabe, Gabe N is Gabe famous Newell for... stops working at Valve, Half-Life 3 released the next day. <laughs> Gabe is just sitting on it to taunt people. He's like, I've already completed Half-Life 4, but you'll never get to play it. It's been fully developed for years. He's just waiting for the right moment. We're actually working on Half-Life 6 right now. <laughs> it's now called Full Life. So, there's no real specific information about what Cliff Blazinski's going to be doing, but it seems like maybe he's going to be doing something else in the games industry. Just well, not working if, at Epic If the anymore. doctors are now working on, like, what is it, philanthropy and beer? Yes. I, I, I'm willing to bet Cliff Blazinski is going to do something far less noble. Like, Cliff Blazinski, now totally interested in making porn. <laughs> yeah, Cliff Blazinski is just going to become a stripper at his local nightclub. He's going to learn to pole dance. The noble profession of pole dancing. Mm. So yeah, the, it, it's interesting that the figureheads of gaming seem to be moving on, like, I'm almost expecting Miyamoto to leave next. Even though I think Nintendo is like, we've got the antidote, you will keep making Mario games. Well, that seems to be a pretty reliable solution. Right? There's a famous anecdote that uh, Miyamoto comes up with ideas for games based on experiences in his life. Like, Pikmin was based on his gardening hobby. And, and there was Zelda the, was entirely the influence of a childhood spent roaming randomly around the uh, Kyoto countryside. Yep. And so the most recent Mario game involves collecting lots and lots of coins. Yep. And so the idea is Miyamoto based that on being rich. Being rich and, and wanting more. And then there's a Nintendo-based webcomic that I want the, to credit This that makes to, me but... terrified that actually Hideo Kojima's games are just based on a childhood spent sneaking around killing people. <laughs> Hideo Kojima's games are based on a childhood of being a clone of the genetically perfect super soldier and trying to make a world where there will always be a place for soldiers. In addition, hiding in boxes. Lots also, of boxes. Also, he has a headphone jack in his Who chest. Who didn't hide in boxes, honestly? I'll admit, I had a box for it. I had, I, I had a box for it at your parents' house. <laughs> Indeed. Who says childhood needs to end? But then, you know, that, you know, turned into... I, I just watched and... Lee Sin jump the entire distance of two lanes. Brawl in the Family is where the Miyamoto coin joke came from. That is a webcomic that is by some dude who really likes Nintendo, and they're all Nintendo jokes, but they're pretty good. I recommend it. So yeah, uh, we've gone for an hour. Do we wish to keep going? Oh, uh, is Mr. Pandaria out? It is, in fact. I have viewed some of it. May I just say that the entire set of jokes slash flirts on the Pandarians are hilarious. Oh, well that's good to hear. And some of them are ridiculously wrong. 
Like, it, it's clear that over the time that uh, WoW has existed, Blizzard has realized they don't need to be tame with the humor on those things anymore. No. How does that game look graphically nowadays? Just about the same. Like, WoW has not vastly improved its graphic level between Cataclysm and Pandaria. Okay. Well, I guess Cataclysm was a fairly substantial overhaul. Yeah. That it, game is super old. It, it is now. We're, we're talking like eight years now. Suffice to say, I think we're about ready for WoW 2. Or Project Titan, as it were. Indeed. But, uh, yeah, it, it seems enjoyable. Like, the animations are cool. Uh, I think WoW is just suffering from the unfortunate uh, lingerings of age. Where it's, yeah, we can't really do a ton of new stuff. Because our engine and the core concepts of our game just don't allow for it. I, I feel like WoW is probably suffering from the decline of the traditional MMO in a lot of ways. Right. On the I, I basis don't even... of games like Borderlands 2 that have such seamless co-op without subscription fees, it's like, yeah, if I, I probably want to play with a relatively small group of friends. You get four people together on Borderlands, and you don't have to pay 15 bucks a month. Right. I, I'm kind of tempted to p play Guild Wars 2 just out of that sentiment that I can pick this up and play it when I want, and I don't feel bad about wasting money if I'm too busy or playing something else. And then, the other thing is that League of Legends always fills that hole. Right. Which is that you can you don't even have to pay anything to get involved in it. It's got a learning curve, but if you have friends who are like, that we, we have four people and we want to hang out with you, so get in the game, they can help teach you. Right. Oh, with, without a doubt, League of Legends is filling the MMO spot in my life right now. Where it's, eh, I've got like an hour of free time, think I'll play this. I can yeah. successfully compete against someone while at the same time, it's not a huge deal if I am not able to play for a while. Yeah. The one reason that League is not like an ultimate uh, time gap filler is that the I, I often so find myself in situations where I don't know how long a match is going to take, yeah. or an urgent interruption comes up yeah. halfway through one. T typically, I try not to start a, ma a match unless I have at least an hour of free time remaining. Which, who has an hour of free time right now? Because right. it's not... <laughs> Never. No. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Right. It it's not the game you pick up if it's like, yeah, I've got 30 minutes between classes. I think I'll just play this. Okay, so we've proposed on the show a system for a replacement queuing in League before, but here's an enhancement to that idea. What if you can flag yourself, like, say, by typing a slash command in the chat box for, I gotta go, so find someone to drop in, and when they drop in, I'll jump out. And so they could even be, like, spectating your character, and then it, it, there would be, like, a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 to swap over. So just so that you know not to start a fight when uh, yeah. you're about to leave. That that would be so amazing, because that's that's usually what happens is like, all right, I gotta go, but I mean I can hold on for like two minutes, yeah. in order to not make my team suffer. And so yeah, I can just mark myself for replacement. The issue is then, it is it fair that if your team is not doing well, for them to insist that you swap out and hopefully get a better player. Uh, I figure that, no, that's not allowed. And maybe you're... Uh... Yeah, that would be nasty, and I wouldn't want to have anybody get that kind of harassment. Yeah, I, the last thing I would want is a player who's not doing well to basically be told, get out of the game or we're going to report you. But I imagine that kind of thing would be very easy to monitor in chat, and that behavior wouldn't be tolerated. Absolutely. Like, that that genuinely seems like a punishable offense. Indeed. It just seems to me, like, I, I often am in situations where I have, like, 20 minutes, and 
I guess Dominion is the right format for that, but I've never played um, Dominion. Your other option, if you have limited time and just like say want to practice one or two things, is queue up for a custom game and either play with friends who know you're going to be leaving or only uh, only play with bots. Because at that point, it doesn't matter when you close that game. It's right. only, you're the only human that's there. Actually, what I have done in that situation, and I often don't have friends online, but I have I have done the tutorial in League, like where it's and <laughs> the that murder kind of, the murder bridge tutorial. Yes. Uh, well, there's two tutorials. There's one that takes place on Summoner's Rift. There's the advanced tutorial. Yeah. And well, that likewise, you can just create a custom game and assign nine bots. Yeah. Okay, that's a good solution. Yeah, that, that's what I do if, like, say, I was queued for a ranked game and was forced to dodge. Like, I don't know if you know this, but when you're queued for ranked, the penalty for dodging is uh, 45 minutes. That is a pretty harsh penalty. But sometimes it's necessary. Like, my situation was my client constantly loses connection, and so when that happened, I ended up getting a randomly selected hero which was an AD carry. We already had one of those on the team. We needed uh -huh. a jungler, which I was supposed to pick. Uh, so it wouldn't have been fair to my team to basically force us to not have a jungler. So I ended up dodging that game, and rather than just leaving League because I wanted to play with my time, I just started up a custom game and practiced a champ that I don't play very often. Good idea. Yeah, I, I actually would like to see that institutionalized where if you have a new champion that you've never played before, the game basically tracks how many times you played a character. You're you not allowed to play it in PvP? Yeah, the first time you play, you have to play either a bot match or a custom game with it. Afterwards, you can actually play a, uh, a normal champ. Like, you can play it in a normal game, like say you've done five bot matches with this champion. Okay, now you can take them into PvP. Sure, sounds legit. Mm -hmm. Just a way to encourage fairness between the teams. Like, I'm sorry, there's no more comment that's more infuriating than first time champ on a person who's like pentakilling. <laughs> well, like, I, I, I would figure the more infuriating comment is somebody who is zero twelve on your team yeah, who is like, like first time champ. Penta killing, then maybe you've got the skills to pay the bills. <laughs> or you're playing one of the easy button characters. I'm sorry, if your character has teleport and a stealth, Shaco, looking at you, your character is easier than other champions. Uh, this just makes me want to get really good at League and then start joining games as Irelia or Oriana and Penta killing and being like first time champ. Irelia is capable of it. Like. Aurelia, and I know everyone hates him, but Darius. Darius is totally pentakill worthy. Champions that are not easy button ones, where it is clear that it is. I'm sorry, but if Darius killed you, you did something wrong. <laughs> yep. Like, I know Darius has an ult that pretty much is a guaranteed kill. You but only to, if you were you dumb enough to, to be there. at low health and go close to him. Right. You had to get hit by him five times for him to get that way. You earned that death. By all means. I, I have... You have you have no sympathy for anyone. I have no sympathy to anyone who whines about Darius because you put yourself in that situation. You walked close enough for him to grab you. You stood there while he was wailing on you. And then you got hit in the face with his ult. You know what really angers a Darius player? When he jumps up to do his ult, and you're instantly like, Exhaust, you just did half damage to me. And yeah. so it basically didn't count at all. Yeah. You hit me as hard as you would have with no stacks. Like, it, it shutting down a lot of champions isn't hard. The biggest advantage in League of Legends is movement. By all means, any totally. any champ that has a free teleport, looking at you, Ezreal. Katarina. Yeah, any champ that's just like, and it's been 12 seconds, I'll be somewhere else. 
Like, the, the current state of the game pretty much requires everyone to have a flash, whether it's built into their character or whether it's uh, you tip the summoner spell flash, you need it, unfortunately, because the enemy's going to have it. The enemy is going to have a method for rapidly either closing or getting away from you. I think the only character who can really get away with not taking it is Lux, because she can lock you in place and walk away. Like, even Morgana, her snare is on such a long cooldown that it's not a reliable form of escape. Yeah, all I'm seeing in League these days is champs who are like, free flash, free flash, free flash. Gotta go. Well, maybe that'll change in Season 3. I, I'm honestly hoping Flash is either deleted or sees a massive nerf in Season 3. That would be pretty cool. Just both Flash I, and Ghost, board. just take them off. Well, you could have Flash, but restrict it to characters that don't already have a Flash mechanic. Like, Ezreal taking Flash is kind of stupid. Likewise, characters that can heal, like Soraka, taking the Summoner spell heal, kind of not fun for the enemy team. When it's, I, I have to deplete this carry's health bar three whole times in order to do any damage to them. Oh man, I want to relay the anecdote of you and I having our entire team trying to focus down an APE while he was meditating, and he was just healing too fast to die. No, oh, I totally found got... a solution to that. You, yeah. You kill him in such a rapid time that he doesn't have a chance to hit the button. Yep. Play Jace, was get Jace to max build, three Where pokes, all five it. of us were focusing him after he hit the button. Yep. And it was hilarious. And it just doesn't work. Alright, now I think we should break because I really am jonesing to play some League. Yeah, right. let's count up. Let's sign off. Alright, so in the meantime, I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Parasim. And we'll catch you next week on Nerd Talk. Stuff!